How many of you were in chapel today? Okay. And uh, how many of you uh, are here tonight who are married, presently married? All right. I assume the rest of you are single. <clears throat> so I hope what I say will apply to both groups. Uh, here's what I hope is going to happen tonight. For those of you that are married, I hope that your marriage will get better because we spent a few minutes together tonight. Would that be all right with you? <laughs> Marriages either get better or they get worse. They never stand still. And I certainly hope your marriage will not get worse because I came. <laughs> and for those of you that are single, I hope that your relationships will get better and not worse. My second desire is that you will learn some things that you will find so helpful that you will want to share them with your friends who are not here tonight but who desperately need help. Do you know the people I'm talking about? <laughs> and my third desire is that we can have a little fun while we do this. Now, I meet people who don't believe in fun. You talk about fun and they say, Oh, no, I'm a Christian. I do want to speak on the topic of two essentials to a long-term healthy marriage. Whether you're married or whether you're single, I think you'll find application to what I'm going to say. Maybe I should ask before I go any further if anyone here has ever lived in North Carolina where I live. Keep your hand up in case I need an interpreter. <laughs> ask these people, what did he say? All right. I believe the two essentials are, number one, that the individuals in that marriage must feel loved and appreciated if it's to be a long-term healthy marriage. Now, you can have a long-term marriage without this. We all know that there are thousands of couples who are married and been married for 20 and 30 years. They live in the same house, but they don't have a healthy marriage. They live as roommates in the same house, processing logistics. But they don't have anything near what the Bible calls becoming one flesh, deep, deep intimacy. They don't, they don't have that. If you're going to have that kind of marriage, you must feel loved and appreciated by your spouse. And so I want to talk just a bit about what is my most popular book, and that is The Five Love Languages. Because here's the problem. I discovered this years ago that what makes one person feel loved does not make another person feel loved. Never forget the first time I encountered this in my office. A couple came in. I found out later they'd been married to each other for 30 years. They sat down, and the wife began the conversation, and she said, Dr. Chapman, I want you to know right up front that we don't have any money problems. I read in a book she said that money was the biggest problem in marriage, but not for us. We don't have any money problems. And I want you to know that... Uh, we don't argue. We don't believe in arguing. And she went on with two or three more positive things, and I'm beginning to wonder, did they come in here to tell me what a good marriage they have? But then she started crying. She said, but Dr. Chapman, the problem is I just don't feel any love coming from him. She said, it's just like we're roommates living in the same house, and I'm so empty. And she just went on and on and on and on. Well, when she finished, I looked over at him, and he said, I don't understand her. <laughs> I do everything I know to show her that I love her. She sits there and says she doesn't feel loved. He said, I don't know what else to do. I said, well, what do you do to show that you love her? He said, well, I get home from work before she does, so I start the evening meal. He said, sometimes I have it ready. If not, she helps me, and we finish, and we eat together. And he said, after dinner, I wash the dishes. And he said, uh, on Thursday nights, I vacuum the floor. And he said, every Saturday, I wash the car. And he said, I walk the dog after I get through with the dishes every night. And he said, uh, he said I mow the grass every Saturday. He said, I help her with the laundry. And he went on, and I was beginning to wonder, what does this woman do? It seemed to me like he was doing everything 
And he said, I do all these things to show her that I love her. And she sits there and says she doesn't feel loved. He said, I don't know what else to do. Well, look back at her. She said, Dr. Chapman, he's right. He's a hard-working man. She said, but Dr. Chapman, we don't ever talk. We haven't talked in 30 years. Said he's always mowing the grass, washing the dishes up. (laughs) You understand what's going on? A sincere husband who is loving his wife in the best way he knows how to express it and a wife who's not getting it. And over the next 15 years, I heard that story over and over and over and over and over in my office. And I knew that there was a pattern to what I was hearing, but I didn't know what it was. So finally, I sat down and read 12 years of notes that I made when I was counseling people and asked myself the question, when someone sat in my office and said, I feel like my spouse doesn't love me. What did they want? What were they complaining about? And their answers fell into five categories, and I later called them the five love languages. I wasn't dogmatic that there's only five, but now that the book's been out for 20 years and sold over 8 million copies in English and been translated in 50 languages around the world, and no one has come back with a convincing sixth or seventh love language, I'm a little more dogmatic. (laughs) People have said to me, Dr. Chapman, there's a sixth language. And I say, what? And they say, chocolate. (laughs) And I say, well, if they bought it, it's a gift. If they made it, it's an act of service. And one guy did say, a sixth love language is shopping. And I said, well, it sounds a lot like quality time to me. She wants you to be with her. So I want to just uh, recap these briefly for you. If you've read the book, it'll be a review. If you haven't read the book, it'll be an introduction. Love language number one is words of affirmation, using words to affirm the other person. You look nice in that outfit. I really appreciate what you did. You can focus on the way they look, on the way they talk, on something they've done for you. You can focus on their personality, but you're using words to affirm them. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, love edifies. Love builds up. So one way to build up a person is to give them words of encouragement. Now I meet people, like a lady some time ago said to me, she said, Gary, I know it would be good if I could give my husband some positive words. She said, but to be honest with you, I can't think of anything good to say about the man. And I said, well, does he ever take a shower? And she said, well, yes. I said, well, how often? She said, every day. I said, if I were you, I'd start there. I appreciate you taking a shower. (laughs) There are men who don't. I have never met a man, never met a woman, that you couldn't find something good to say about them. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 18. No, chapter 18, verse 21. Says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. You can kill your spouse or give them life by the way you talk to them. Same thing is true about your children. You see, ladies, when you give him a positive word, there's something inside of him that wants to be better. And when you give him a critical word, there's something inside of him that wants to shoot you. (laughs) I remember when our children were little, my wife would tell our children what a great father I was. And I knew she was going beyond reality a lot of the times. But every time she told him how great I was, it made me want to be as good as she said I was. It's powerful to give your spouse, or anyone else for that matter, positive words. A second love language is gifts. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. In that illustration, Christ himself is the gift. The scriptures say that all good gifts come down from God. It's universal to give gifts as an expression of love. Now the gift need not be expensive. Haven't we always said it's the thought that counts? But I remind you, it's not the thought left in your head that counts. It's the gift that came out of the thought in your head. You know guys, 
you can get flowers free a good bit of the year. Just go out in your backyard and pick one. That's what your kids do. How many mothers have ever received a dandelion from your kids? Yeah, yeah. Now, guys, I'm not suggesting dandelions, okay? <laughs> you don't have any flowers in your backyard? Your neighbor's yard. Ask them. <laughs> They'll give you a flower. Or you could go to a funeral and ask the family. They'll give you a flower. <laughs> I did that not long ago. I went to a funeral, and after the funeral, the church had a luncheon for the family, and I went to the luncheon, and I walked in, and I noticed they had these vases of red roses. So when I got ready to go, I just said to one of the ladies, I said, would you mind if I take one of those roses to my wife? She said, oh, Dr. Chapman, you can have this whole vase. I go home with two dozen red roses. I told her where I got them. She still liked them. You can pick up a stone in a city parking lot and take it home and give it to an eight-year-old boy and say, hey, man, I found this today. Look at the colors in here. I thought about you. I wanted you to have this. If gifts is his love language, when he's 23, you will find it in his dresser drawer, and he'll remember the day you gave it to him. Gifts are powerful communicators, and for some people, they speak very deeply of love. Number three is acts of service. Acts of service. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. Love not only in word, but in deed. Do something to show your love. Now in a marriage, that is such things as cooking meals. Incidentally, anybody here still cook? A few of you. Yeah, yeah. My son came home. He didn't get married until he was 34. People would ask him, when are you going to get married? When are you going to get married? And he would say, when you grow up in the home of a marriage counselor, you're very careful. <laughs> but at any rate, after he got married, he came home six months later and he said, Dad, I got a bonus when I married Amy. I said, really? He said, yeah, Dad, she likes to cook. He said, I never thought I'd find a girl in my generation that liked to cook. And then my daughter married a man that liked to cook, so my kids got it made. Washing dishes is an act of service. For those of you that are married, who, who washes dishes at your house? Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. Vacuuming floors is an act of service. Yeah, for those of you that are single, answer these questions for your mom and daddy. You know, just looking back on your, on your, on your home, okay? Uh, getting white spots off the mirror. Yeah. Uh, cleaning the toilet. A lot of you, nobody's cleaning the toilet. <laughs> Walking the dog, mowing the grass, washing the car. All those things that guy was doing I talked about a while ago. He was doing acts of service. Acts of service. And for some people, this is what communicates that you love them. Number four is spending quality time. By which I mean you give them your undivided attention. Mark chapter 3 and verse 14 says of Jesus that he ordained 12. We call them the 12 disciples. Now listen, that he might be with them. Jesus preached to multitudes, but he had 12 men that he gave quality time to. Now in a marriage, I'm, I'm not talking about sitting in the same room and the two of you watching television. Someone else has your attention. I'm talking about sitting in the same room on the couch with the TV off, looking at each other and talking. Those of you that are married, do you have couches? What do you do with those things? Have you ever tried this? Sitting on the couch with the TV off, looking at each other. It can be scary at first. <laughs> and talking to each other. Or taking a walk down the road, just the two of you and talking or going out to eat, assuming you talk to each other. Have you ever noticed in a restaurant, you can almost always tell the difference between dating couples and married couples. <laughs> dating couples will look at each other and talk. Married couples sit there and... <laughs> you'd think they went there to eat. 
if I sit on the couch with my wife and give her 20 minutes looking, listening, interacting with her, I have given her 20 minutes of my life, and she has done the same for me. It's a powerful communicator when you give someone your undivided attention. Number five is physical touch. We've long known the emotional power of physical touch. That's why we pick up babies and hold them and kiss them and cuddle them. And long before the baby understands the meaning of the word love, the baby feels loved by physical touch. Now, in a marriage, I'm talking about such things as holding hands, kissing, embracing, the whole sexual part of the marriage, arm around the shoulder, driving down the road, you put your hand on their leg, sitting around the house, and they walk by, and you trip them. (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. As a matter of fact, if you're married, why don't you reach over right now and just touch each other? And all you singles, give an appropriate touch to somebody beside of you. Yeah, it's all right. Come on. You don't have to be married to touch. Yeah, yeah. Physical touch. Now listen to me carefully. Out of those five love languages, each of us, married or single, young or old, each of us has a primary love language. One of those five speaks more deeply to us emotionally than the other four. Now, we can receive love in all five, but if we had to give up one, we'd give up this one, or this one, or this one, but not this one. This is the one that really makes me feel love. It's very similar to spoken language. Every one of us grew up speaking a language with a dialect. I grew up speaking English Southern style, but everyone grows up speaking a language with a dialect, and that's the one you understand best. The same thing is true with love. Now, once in a while, someone says to me, I don't know, Gary, I think two of those are just about equal for me. And my response is, fine, we'll give you two love languages. We'll call you bilingual. But most of us have a primary love language, a secondary love language, and then the other three fall in line under that. In a marriage, seldom does a husband and wife have the same love language. It happens, but not very often. And by nature, we speak our own language. So whatever makes me feel loved is what I'm going to do for my spouse. So let's say that words of affirmation is my language. And I don't know anything about love languages, but I I get married. What am I going to do for my wife? I'm going to give her words of affirmation. I'm going to tell her how nice she looks. I'm going to tell her how much I appreciate what she did. I'll probably tell her a dozen times a day, honey, I love you. I cannot tell you how much I love you. I love you so much. But let's say words is not her language. Let's say acts of service is her language. But I don't ever do anything to help her. It's just a matter of time. One night, she's going to say to me, you keep on saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. If you love me, why don't you help me? And I will be blown out of the saddle. Why? Because in my mind, I've been loving her. In her mind, if I loved her, I'd be helping her. I believe there are literally thousands of married couples who are loving each other, but they're not connecting with each other. And some of them have been like this for 20 and 30 years. And in their minds, they're loving the other person. But in the mind of the other person, they're not feeling loved. So the key is that we must learn to speak the language of the other person. Now someone says, Gary, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it, but what if the love language of the spouse is something that doesn't come natural for you? And my answer, so you learn it. My wife's language is acts of service. One of the things I do for her is vacuum the floors. Now you don't know me well, but do you think that vacuum and floors comes natural for me. (laughs) My mother made me vacuum 
all through junior high and high school. I could not go play ball on Saturday until I vacuumed the house. On, in those days, I said to myself, if I ever get out of here, <laughs> one thing I'm not going to do, I am not going to vacuum floors. You could not pay me enough to vacuum floors. There's only one reason I vacuum floors. L-O-V-E. You see, when it doesn't come natural, it's a greater expression of love. My wife knows every time I vacuum the floor, it's nothing but 100% pure, unadulterated love. And I get credit for the whole thing. We were sitting around the other night. My wife said, you know, honey, these blinds are getting dusty. I looked over at the blinds and I said, uh, they are, aren't they, honey? That's all I said. But I heard the lady. I cataloged it. So two mornings later, it was a Friday morning. I was getting ready to leave later that day to go do a marriage seminar. It's about 6.30 on Friday morning. I was in there vacuuming those blinds. She stumbled in and said, honey, what are you doing? I said, honey, I'm making love. <laughs> Big smile broke on her face, and she said, you have got to be the greatest husband in the world. Now, my love language is words of affirmation, so I said to her, tell me one more time, babe, how great am I? <laughs> she told me again. I get on the plane with a full love tank, and she goes back to finish her nap with a full love tank. Why? I spoke her language, and she spoke my language. You understand why I would say that what I've just shared with you could literally save thousands of marriages. In fact, every Saturday when I lead seminars, I'll have at least half a dozen couples come up and say, Gary, we were that close to divorce. And somebody gave us a copy of your book. And it was like the lights came on. And we looked back over our marriage and realized how we had missed each other for years. And we took the test and figured out what our language is and we tried it, and our whole marriage turned around. You see, because we so desperately need love, when you start getting it in the right language, you are emotionally drawn to that other person. Can emotional love be reborn in a marriage? You bet. You bet. It doesn't come with the passing of time. It comes with knowledge and it comes with a willingness to do it. Now, I did meet one man who said to me, he said, I, I understand that love language stuff. He said, I understand that. He said, my wife's language is, is acts of service. And he said, but I'm just going to tell you right now, if it's going to take my washing dishes and vacuuming floors and doing the laundry, you can forget about that. And I said, well, that's your choice. If you want to live with a woman who has an empty love tank, that's your choice. I much prefer to live with a wife who has a full love tank. If washing dishes and vacuuming floors and doing the laundry is going to make my wife feel loved, I say, bring on the laundry and give me the vacuum cleaner. It's a small price to pay to live with a happy woman. You see, the emotional need for love affects everything else in the marriage relationship. And incidentally, I won't talk about it now, but we can if you want to in the, in the Q&A. The same principle applies to raising children. Every child has a primary love language. It's not enough for parents to be sincere. The, almost all parents love their children, but not all children feel loved. So we have to learn how to love children. You know, it's very, been very interesting to me in that little, in, in Titus chapter 4, I think it is, where it says the older women are to teach the younger women to love their husbands and to love their children. You read that and ask, what? You have to have a class in learning to love your husband and your kids? I thought mothers just naturally love their children. What has to be learned, I believe, is how to express love in a way that's going to be meaningful to the child and meaningful to the adult, okay? All right, let me stop there with that. <clears throat> The second essential in having a good, healthy, long-term marriage is that you deal effectively with your failures. Now, I, I gave 
an overview of this this morning in chapel, but many of you were not in chapel, so I'm going to take five minutes or so here and just recap what I said this morning in chapel, and then I want to go a little further because I didn't have time to, to get to some things I want to get to tonight. What I discovered a few years ago with the help of Dr. Jennifer Thomas, who is a Christian counselor in my city, who came to me with this idea <clears throat> that people also have not only love languages, but they have apology languages. And I said to her, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, I think that just like in your love language book, people have different languages, I think that people have different ideas about what it means to apologize. The second essential is that we have to deal effectively with our failures. Because if you don't deal effectively with your failures, you're going to create a wall between the two of you. It happens one offense at a time. Somebody does or says something or fails to do or say something and there's an offense and if we ignore it and act like nothing happened, we put a block in a wall, and then there's another experience and another, and we build a wall between the two of us, and you're not going to have a healthy marriage. You can live forever in the same house, but if there's a wall between the two of you, it's not going to be a healthy marriage. We've got to deal effectively with our failures, and that is apologizing and forgiving. So what I shared this morning was the results of two years of research that we did across the country asking thousands of people two questions. When you apologize, what do you typically say or do? And when someone apologizes to you, what do you want to hear them say and do? And their answers fell into five categories. I promise you, we were not looking for five. I like five, but we weren't looking for five. And I just want to give them to you, recap them for you, because most of you were here this morning. Uh, one is expressing regret. I'm sorry. Should not have done that. I deeply regret what I've done. Sorry that I lost my temper and yelled at you. Sorry that I came home late and we've missed the program. Tell them what you're sorry for and don't ever put a but in there. Don't say I'm sorry that I lost my temper, but if you had not, then I would not, okay? Expressing regret. This morning I gave scriptures for these. I won't give the scriptures tonight. Uh, you can find them if you, if you want to get them from this morning's chapel program. Uh, a second uh, language of apology is accepting responsibility. I was wrong. I was wrong. No excuse for what I did. I accept responsibility for what I did. And for some people, this is what they consider to be an apology. And if you don't admit that you're wrong, in their mind, you have not apologized. Incidentally, <clears throat> this is the first step in teaching children how to apologize. Help them accept responsibility for their behavior. A three-year-old or four-year-old breaks a cookie and says, it broke. It broke. And the parent says, honey, let's say that a different way. I broke the cookie. It is not a sin to break a cookie. But we're helping that child accept responsibility for their behavior. My son was probably six or seven when he accidentally knocked the glass off the table. It hit the kitchen floor and shattered. I was in the kitchen, so I looked at him, and he said, It did it by itself! <laughs> and I said, Derek, let's say that a different way. I accidentally knocked the glass off the table. And he said, I accidentally knocked the glass off the table. It's not a sin to accidentally knock a glass off a table. I'm just trying to help him accept responsibility for what he did. I was wrong. Should not have done that. Okay? The third apology language is offering to make restitution. Offering to make restitution. What can I do to make this up to you? How can I make things right between us? I know I've hurt you deeply, but I value our relationship, and I want to make things right. What can I do? And for some people, this is what it means to apologize. And if you don't offer to make restitution, in their mind, you have not yet apologized. Number four is genuinely repenting or expressing the desire to change. I don't like the fact that I did this again. I know I did the same thing last week. 
and I don't like this. Can we talk? I want to find a way to break this habit because I don't like this. I don't want to keep doing this. And for some people, if you don't give evidence that you are trying to change the behavior, they're going to have a hard time forgiving you because in their mind, you have not apologized unless you're trying to change the behavior. And then number five is requesting forgiveness. Will you please forgive me? I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me. I value our relationship, and I, I, I hope you can forgive me. Now, I said this morning, I fully admit that I never thought of this as a, as a way of apologizing. Because in my mind, I thought people should know if you're apologizing in any way, don't they know you want to be forgiven? Why do you have to ask them to forgive you? But for some people, this is what it means to apologize, that you're asking for forgiveness. And if you don't ask forgiveness in their mind, you've not apologized. So here's what's happened, as I see it in marriages, is that there has been a fair amount of apology, but often we are apologizing in the way our parents taught us to apologize. That's where we get these languages. But the other person grew up in a different family, and they have a different idea of what it means to apologize. So you say, I'm sorry, and they're thinking you certainly are. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to say? You think you've apologized, and they're saying to you, you have not apologized. They're waiting for you to say one of these other things. So in a family, I'm encouraging you to process this and, and see what each of you considers to be an apology, particularly in a marriage, because you came out of different families. You're going to teach your children. Hopefully, you're going to teach your children how to apologize. And you start with what I said earlier, teaching them to accept responsibility. But you came out of different families, and you need to learn what each of you considers to be an apology. And there's one other element here, and that is the nature of the offense will also affect how you apologize. If it's a minor offense, then just to speak the one language that's, that communicates to them is probably going to be satisfactory. But if it's a major offense, I suggest you use all five. <laughs> and, and I'm sorry it's not going to be enough in, in, many, in many instances. So what I, what I suggested this morning, what I'm suggesting to you tonight is that we learn in the family how to express uh, uh, apology to each other and then we choose to forgive. Forgiveness is the next step. An offense is committed, an apology is made, and then forgiveness. Now, I want to talk a little more tonight about forgiveness that I didn't have time to talk about this morning. Ephesians 4.32 says, We are to forgive each other. Listen carefully. We are to forgive each other just as in Christ God forgave you. In other words, God is our model in forgiving. And we're to forgive others in the same way that God forgives us. How does God forgive us? If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us. God does not just blanket forgive everybody. God forgives people who are willing to confess, to apologize, to acknowledge their failure, and reach out to Him. And because Christ paid our penalty... God can forgive us and still be a just God. Now that's the model for us. An offense is committed, we apologize, and the person chooses to forgive us. Now, I just stated these things this morning, but I want to I speak a little more about them tonight. I want to give you three or four or five statements on what forgiveness does not do. Because there's a lot of fuzzy thinking about this among a lot of us. Number one, forgiveness does not destroy our memory. You've heard people say, perhaps, if you have not forgotten, you have not forgiven. I don't think that's true at all. Everything that's ever happened to us in our whole life is printed in the brain. And from time to time, the memory of what they did to you is going to come back to your mind. Even after, you've chosen, they've, even after they've apologized and you've forgiven them, it's going to come back. And with that memory, there's going to come emotions because forgiveness does not erase the emotions. So you remember what they did 
and you have pain again. It may be hurt, it may be anger, but you have emotions that come again with the memory. Now, what are you going to do if they sinned, they apologized, you chose to forgive them, but here you are three months, three years later, and the memory comes back and the pain comes back? What are you going to do with that? I suggest you take it to God. And you say to God, Lord, you know what I'm remembering tonight. And you know what I'm feeling again. But I thank you that that's forgiven. Now help me to do something that's worthwhile today. And you don't allow the memory or the emotions of the past to mess up a new day. Thirdly, forgiveness does not remove all the consequences of sin. In our day, in some circles, you almost get the idea that sin is not all that bad. God will forgive you, and it'll all be over, and it doesn't matter what you've done, everything's going to be okay. No question about it, God will forgive you if you confess your sin. But confession and forgiveness does not remove all the consequences of sin. The husband who falls in love with another woman, walks off and leave his, leaves his wife and two kids, eventually goes off and marries the other lady. Ten years later, he may come to know Christ as his Savior. He may confess his sins to God. And he may come back and confess and apologize to his wife and to his three children. And they may well forgive him, and they should forgive him but it doesn't bring back the lost time with those kids. And it doesn't bring back the lost time with that wife. And I could, there are a thousand of other illustrations. We are never better for having sinned. We're always worse for having sinned. A lot of biblical examples of that. Fourth, forgiveness does not rebuild trust. I often have people say to me, well, you know, I, I forgave him or I forgave her, but to be very honest with you, I don't trust them. And they're almost feeling guilty that they don't trust them. And I say, welcome to the human race. Because forgiveness does not restore trust. Forgiveness opens the door to the possibility that trust can be restored. I, often, I encounter this most often and most strongly where one of them has been sexually unfaithful to the other, and eventually they wake up and they apologize and they come back and they confess and they apologize and the person chooses to forgive them, but they still don't trust them. And I say to the one who offended, if you want your spouse to trust you again, then you must be trustworthy. They lost trust because you were untrustworthy. Now you must be trustworthy. And if you want a practical way to do that, you say to your spouse, my cell phone is yours anytime you want to check it. My computer is yours anytime you want to look at it. And if I tell you that I'm going over to George's house to help him work on his car, it's fine with me if you call over there and make sure I'm there. I am through with deceit. My life is an open book. And if you take that response, in due time, your spouse will come to trust you again. So forgiveness does not restore trust. It opens the door to the possibility of trust. And number five, forgiveness does not always result in reconciliation. In the illustration I just gave you of the husband who left and, and remarried, his wife can forgive him, his children can forgive him, but they are not reconciled. Reconciliation means it goes back to where it was and we start again. He's already remarried. They're not going to be reconciled. So forgiveness does not always equal reconciliation. Now here, here's, a, here's a key question, and that is, what if the person offends you, but they don't apologize? Well, the Bible is very, very clear on what we're to do at this point. Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4. Jesus said very clearly, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. A very clear picture. Offense committed. They don't come to apologize. You go to them and confront them with what's happened. And if they repent, you forgive them. 
That's the ideal pattern. If they don't come to apologize, you go to them. Now, the word rebuke literally means to put a weight upon. It's like putting a paperweight on a stack of papers. And if you've ever been rebuked, that's what it feels like. They kind of lay something on you. I like to say we lovingly confront them. I get the loving part from Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 that says if you see a brother overtaken in a fault, those of you who are spiritual, go restore such a one in a spirit of meekness because next time you may be the one that's sinning. So we go lovingly confront. It's, 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 it's something like this. You go to them and say, I really value our relationship and maybe I have misread this whole thing, but I'm feeling hurt and I'm feeling angry. And because I value our relationship, I want to share this with you. That when you did da-da-da-da-da, I was crushed inside. And you explain to them what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and how hurt you are. And you come back and say, maybe I misread the whole thing. But I'm coming to you because I want to get this thing right if we can. And you take that kind of loving approach. You make it easier for them to say, I was wrong. Should not have done that. And go ahead and give you an apology so that you can then forgive them. That's the ideal. Now let's say we do that, but our spouse or anyone else does not apologize even after we've confronted them. Here, here for example, is a, a husband who has been unfaithful to his wife. She confronts him with that. He denies it. That's almost always the first response. No, no, nothing, nothing's going on. We're just friends. Nothing, nothing, nothing. But then two months later, she finds out the real truth, and she confronts him with that, and he says, okay, you're right, but if you think I'm going to break this relationship off, you're wrong. If you want to leave me, fine, but I'm not going to break this off. So she's confronted, but he didn't repent. And so she holds all this pain inside, all this hurt inside, and then three months later, she finally goes to her pastor and shares her pain and her hurt and her sorrow and her anger and all that's going on inside of her. And the pastor, because he wants to help her, says to her, you're going to have to forgive him or it's going to kill you. And now she goes home feeling guilty because she can't forgive him. Now my question is this. Has God forgiven him? Not if he's still living in sin. God has not forgiven him. So the pastor is asking her to do something that even God hasn't done. Now, this is why I choose to use the word release rather than forgive. You release that husband to God and you release your anger to God knowing that God is a just God and a loving God. And if that husband ever repents, God will forgive him. And when he repents, you can forgive him. But to put the pressure of a wife on a wife to forgive a husband whom God hasn't forgiven, I think is undue pressure, even though the pastor's trying to help her. Now, I understand what the pastor's trying to do. He's trying to get her to, to let go of the anger and the hurt inside of her so that she can go on with her life. And that is, that is a worthy objective. And I'm not going to quibble about it, but I just prefer to use the word release. And I can't tell you how many people have said to me when I've shared what I'm sharing with you, Gary, for the first time in my life, it makes sense to me. I, I, yes, I can release him to God. I can release her to God. And I can release my anger to God. And that's what God wants you to do. Release your anger to him. Don't hold anger inside. Anger held inside becomes sinful. It becomes bitterness. It becomes hatred, both of which are condemned in the Bible. We're not to hold that anger inside. If they don't repent after we confront them, we're to release them to God. Uh, biblical examples of that, uh, uh, for example, Paul said about Alexander the coppersmith in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He's writing to Timothy. He said, Timothy, 
Alexander the coppersmith did me great evil. The Lord will reward him for what he's done. He didn't say he forgave him. He turned him over to God. And he said, Timothy, keep an eye out for this man because he'll probably also do you wrong. So we release the person to God. Uh, and then, so the first step is we lovingly confront. The second step is we release them to God if they don't, don't repent. The third step is we pray for them and stand ready to forgive them. We're always ready to forgive them. Remember the prayer of Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Read it carefully. It's a prayer, not a proclamation. He was not declaring them forgiven. He was praying that they would be forgiven. And a few weeks later, Peter is preaching to the same group that killed Jesus and said, you have killed the king of glory and I call you to repent. And the Bible says many of them believed and many of the priests believed. So Jesus was dying so they could be forgiven. And he was praying for their forgiveness. And we should always pray that they will come to repentance so that we can forgive them. And then number four, which you will never do without the help of God, is you return good for evil. You return good for evil. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Do not take revenge. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In so doing, you heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. I don't think you'll do that without the help of God. That's not natural to return good for evil. I remember the wife who said to me, Gary, I, uh, my husband had left me, had moved in with another lady, and I was praying one day, and I read this passage, and I felt God say to me so clearly, you need to bake your husband's favorite pie and take it over there and give it to him. And she said, I said, God, if I bake his pie and take it over there, I'll throw it in his face. <laughs> and she said, for two or three days, I struggled with that. And eventually I said, okay, God. So I baked his favorite pie. I went over to his apartment and knocked on his door. And when he came to the door, I talked to him through the screen door and, and just said to him, when I was reading the scripture the other day, God impressed me on me to bake your, pie, your favorite pie and to bring it to you. And so I brought it. He opened the door and took the pie and said, well, that's very kind of you. He closed the door and went back in his apartment. She said, Gary, that was the first step in our two-year process of reconciliation. She said, I hate to think what would have happened if I had not listened to God and returned good for evil. You see, you can't make somebody reconcile. But if you follow the pattern I've just laid out for you, you're doing exactly what the Bible teaches us to do. And you are an instrument in the hand of God to influence that other person. They may or may not come back and reconcile with you. But you can look yourself in the mirror, you can look God in the face, and you can go on with your life. All right, let me stop and let me open it up for questions. You can just get up and walk to the mic. That'd probably be the fastest thing. <laughs> While you're walking, I'll just say this. If you get these two things in place, if you learn how to speak each other's love language and you learn how to apologize to each other effectively and you choose to forgive each other, you can have a healthy, long-term marriage. You do not have to be perfect to have a good marriage, but you do have to deal effectively with your failures. Well, this is unlike all the other meetings I've had with students. They're asking questions, but they, yes, go ahead. Gifts. So after you get married, I feel like the primary man would be like actually kind of silly. Okay. So by our kids come along, probably I feel like a little bit different. I feel like the love language has to be like changing over time. 
Okay, she's saying uh, she feels like her love language changed after she got married. That before marriage, the love language, her love language was gifts. After she got married, she feels like it's acts of service. And my answer is this. I think that the love language, like many other personality traits, tends to stay with us for a lifetime. However, in certain life situations, one of the other love languages may become more important at the moment for, for a period of time. Uh, for example, uh, after marriage, there were things to be done that weren't there to be done before you got married. So now, and perhaps you're in school or doing other things, and now his helping you is really speaking deeply to you, whereas before it was only gifts. Uh, I'll give you another example. A mother with three preschool children, her language may not be acts of service, but I can tell you during those years, his helping her is going to speak deeply to her, and it may appear that it's changed. But after the situation has changed, I think you'll find yourself going back to, your, to the original love language. Yeah, good question. Yes? Yes, the same five love languages. And in the book on children, uh, the five love languages of children, which I wrote with a psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Uh, Ross Campbell, we talk about how, how you discover the child's language and how it interfaces with the child's anger, with discipline, and with learning. And, and please don't hear me saying with children that you only speak their primary language. No, you give them heavy doses of their primary language, and then you sprinkle in the other four. Because we want the child to learn how to receive love and give love in all five languages. That's the healthiest adult. But I can almost guarantee you that most of us did not receive all five languages growing up. We received one or two or three. So that, that's the pattern for children. Yes? Yeah, I'm really trying to get, get what you're saying, but I, I'm not hearing you. It's hard to get out, I can see. <laughs> okay. If you have a question, maybe you want to get out now, uh, so you'll be ready. All right. All right. So, um, so is it possible to forgive someone? even if they haven't repented? Or should we only follow like God's example, as you said, and only forgive someone after they've repented? It all depends on what you mean by forgiveness. Some people call that one-sided forgiveness. If that's what they want to call it, I'm not going to argue with them. It doesn't reconcile. It doesn't remove the barrier. It doesn't restore. The, it doesn't open the door to restore anything. One-sided forgiveness helps you, but it doesn't do anything for the relationship. I just prefer to call it releasing them to God. To me, that makes more sense. It's more in keeping with the biblical pattern. You release them to God, and that helps you. It doesn't restore the relationship either. It doesn't remove the barrier either. It's just that you, you, you let go of your hurt and your bitterness, and you, you let go of them so that you're not going to try to make them pay for it. You're going to turn them over to God, who is the just judge. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Daniel Flavin. I'm a student here. And uh, I was wondering, since you've been talking so much about how these principles work in marriage, could you um, maybe talk about some similarities or differences and how they might play out with, say, a roommate or a dating relationship? Yeah, I think they apply fully as well in the dating relationship. Yeah, I have a book called The Five Love Languages Singles Edition for single adults in which I apply this concept for the between the single and their parents the single and siblings, the single and college roommates, the single and dating partners, the single and work associates, because I think the same principle is true. Obviously, these are different relationships other than marriage, but all of us have the need to feel loved by the significant people in our lives. And many young adults come to adulthood with fractured relationships with their parents, for example or fracture relationships with a brother or a sister. And what I've, these two essentials I've shared can be extremely helpful 
in restoring relationships. I remember the brother, the young, young adult brother, who came to me and he said, Gary, my brother and I had a falling out 10 years ago over some, I forget what it was now. We had a falling out, and I have not spoken to my brother in 10 years. And he said, now I've become a Christian, and I've been studying the Bible, and I just don't think it's right for two brothers to live in the same city and not talk to each other. And I think I need to do something about it. Well, I obviously conferred. He does need to do something about it. So we talked about it. And uh, we talked about the power of apology and how if he was willing to take the initiative, there's a chance that the relationship might be restored. So we sat there in my office and carved out an apology for him to make that included all five apology languages. And I said, now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to call your brother on the phone. Remember, haven't talked in 10 years. Call your brother on the phone and ask him if you could possibly come by and see him. And if he says no way, that's fine. You just say, I understand. And we'll try it again in six weeks. So he called his brother. And on the first call, his brother said, yeah, that would be fine. After 10 years. Yeah, that'd be fine. So I said to him, all right, now, when you go over there to see your brother and knock on the door and he comes to the door, don't you talk about the weather. And don't you talk about sports. As soon as he opens that door, you say to him, I have come to apologize. And then you move into your apology. And then just see what happens. That's precisely what he did. His brother was standing behind the screen door while he apologized. And when he got through, his brother opened the door, came out on the porch, put his arms around his brother and said, you don't know how many times I wanted to come to you and apologize. And the brothers hugged each other and cried with each other and then had a further conversation and ended up the brother invited him to bring his wife over this Friday night for a cookout and the whole relationship was restored. It's the power of apology, no matter what the relationship. And so, and, it, and you know, many times we say, well, it was really their fault. I mean, it was 95% their fault. Okay, let it be 95% their fault, but you go apologize for your 5%. You know, in this case, he was apologizing that he had, that he had allowed whatever it was that happened to separate them for 10 years. And he said, that's not right. You know, so... I think it certainly has relation, uh, certainly applies to all the relationships. And in, 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 in uh, roommate situations, now we're not talking about love, but we are talking about appreciation. And so speaking, speaking the appreciation language, if you want to call it that, to roommates, respecting them as an individual, and also confronting each other when you feel like the other one's treating you unfairly in the room, that's authentic friendships. That's, that's the way you build relationships, is to say, you know, I, I want to share this with you. Maybe there's nothing can be done about it, but I want to share with you that this, this, this has just been hurting me and irritating me. And I don't know, maybe you can't change it. Maybe you shouldn't change it. But I just want to share it with you because I, 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 want, I want us to have a, a good relationship. And that kind of honesty and openness with a roommate can go a long ways in, in moving that relationship simply from being roommates to begin to develop a friendship. Yeah, good question, thank you. Hi, my name is Erica, and um, I was just wondering around what age do you think uh, people start, start figuring out their love language? Would it be when they're in eighth grade or in high school? I think a parent can understand a child's love language by the time they're four years old. Just observe their behavior. My son, I learned his language when he was four or so. When I would come home in the afternoon, he would run up to me and grab my leg and climb up on me. He's touching me because he wants to be touched. Our daughter never did that. Our daughter would say, Daddy, come to my room. I want to show you something. She wanted quality time. Incidentally, my daughter's here tonight. Shelly, stand up or wave or something. <laughs> <laughs> Shelly's, Shelly's now a medical doctor and has two children of her own, so she's loving them and teaching them to apologize. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think a, a parent can learn that. And actually, we, we have a book now for children on the five love languages, children ages four to eight, 
It's called a perfect pet for Peyton, in which we use animals to teach the child the love languages. Mama has a language, daddy has a language, sister has a language. It's a fun, it's a fun book. Children can learn the concept rather early, you know, if, if, if parents teach it to them. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Uh, a perfect pet for Peyton. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Dr. Chapman, for your thorough um, explanation on forgiveness, um, or I mean, apologizing. I was wondering for making offering to make restitution. If they say, "Oh no, that's fine. You don't have to do anything," would you still recommend doing it anyway, or is that better to respect what they're saying? Or yeah, good good question. I would first of all, I would encourage you if if making restitution is meaningful to you, and a person says, "What can I do to make it up?" Please tell them. Please tell them. But if they say, no, 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 you don't need to do anything, that's, that's all right, you know. I think you have, you have to think about it in your own mind and ask yourself, is there something else I could do that would really communicate to them that I, I, I deeply regret what I did? And if, if God brings something to your mind, I think it's okay to go ahead and do it. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I was just wondering, do you suggest um, if you have like, a bunch of, like, I have three boys and my husband, so I really have four boys. <laughs> but <laughs> is it a good thing to find out all their love languages and to sit down and to go over that? Yes, so you I, kind of start to understand it just seems there's a lot of testosterone in the house. And, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. I think, I think if they're five years of age and older, you can discuss this with children. They can understand it clearly and they can realize that we do have different languages, different love languages, and it enhances the whole family relationship. Because if you see a child that's kind of down, you can say to a brother, hey, hey, John, I think, he, I think your brother needs a little love language from you. And so he knows now how to go love his brother. So yeah, I think it can be, it can be a fun thing in the house, and I think it'd be excellent to share it with the kids. Hello. Um, I had a question about singles in the church, um, not so much college age, but like later on in life, maybe late 20s, 30s, even up to 40s and older. I have just recently been talking to people about it, and we've been discussing how I feel like perhaps the church doesn't do a very good job of loving the singles in the church. And do you, would you agree with that, or do you, does that make sense? Am I making sense here? Yes, I do. I do agree that uh, that many churches, maybe even most churches, do are not sensitive enough to to young single adults. I'm, I'm not talking again about college students or those just right out of college, but just a little bit older than that, young career people. Uh, and many times they will say to you, "I just I've been going to this church, but I, there's nothing going on here for me," you know. And, and all the illustrations are couples, <laughs> uh, and seldom is it addressed to, to singles. Yeah. No, I think that is a problem. And do you have any suggestions then for solutions to this problem, or I don't know? I, I think it takes vision on the part of leadership for anything to be done about it. But I think if the leadership of the church has the vision that we not only have young career people in our, in our church, but we, we want to reach young career people, then it's pretty easy to come up with ideas on how, how we can do this and make room for this. There's a lot of ways to build bridges between singles and marriage, and there's a lot of ways to help couples learn how to relate to each other and social activities together, Bible studies together, and that sort of thing that are sponsored by the church and not just something that the that the singles came up with themselves. I mean, it's fine to do it yourself, but it's encouraging to know that the church recognizes our group as an official group of the church. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm not a student. Uh, married 18 years, together 25, three kids. Um, my question is for stubborn couples. Um, when you've sort of fallen into a pattern of not apologizing to each other, either one, um, how do you make yourself come back to that yeah. point where you can move forward yeah. and not just operate as parents? Good, good question, and, and let's face it, there are thousands of couples that are right there. 
They fall into a pattern of never dealing with failures, not expressing, don't even talk about or even think about each other's love language. They're just carrying out the logistics of life together. And she's asking, how do you break through into that? Well, what a lot of husbands and wives will say to themselves is, well, I would treat her different if she'd treat me different. And you can sit there for 20 years with that attitude. What I say is this. One person cannot restore health in a marriage, but one person can greatly influence the spouse. So the challenge I give is for the individual that's willing to work on the marriage is to learn the love language of the spouse and begin speak, ask God to give you the ability to speak it on a regular basis At least every week you're going to speak their love language, no matter whether things change or whether they don't change. And over the long haul, you're going to begin to do this. And once you've been doing this about three months, you say to your spouse, I want to ask you a real personal question. On a scale of zero to ten, how much love do you feel coming from me? And if they say five, six, four, three, two, one, you know you're not quite there yet. And so you might want to reassess whether you're speaking the right language to them. But whenever they give you an 8, 9, or 10, you know that you're getting through to them. So a week later, you can say to them, "Uh, you know something I would really like for you to do for me? And you make a request of them. And because they have been feeling your love over a period of time, they're, they're very likely to reciprocate to your request. And what you're doing is teaching them how to speak your love language even though they don't even know anything about the concept. Because love stimulates love. Remember, we love God because God first loved us. The same principle is true in your relationship. So I would say to that person that that wants to get things moving in a positive direction, you take the initiative in loving and you take the initiative in apologizing and that person's going to recognize, first of all, something is going on with this woman or with this man, because you're responding to them in a different way. Okay? Uh, hi. Um, I have a lot of uh, friends who live a long, long way away. Um, how and how intentional should I be in demonstrating these love languages to them? Yeah, close, close friends who are at, who are at a distance from each other, geographically different from each other, A lot depends on what kind of contact you have with them already. And today we have more avenues to have contact with than we've ever had before. So I think you use the avenues that you have to communicate love to them and appreciation to them. Uh, You know, we just just released the 1st of September a special edition of the Five Love Languages for military couples. And what we're doing in that book is teaching them how to speak all five languages when, when the spouse is deployed half a world away. And people say, how can you do that with physical touch? I mean, ah. Well, I'll just give you one example. A lady said to me, my husband's language is physical touch, so I put my hand on a sheet of paper and trace it. And I mail it to my husband. And I told him, put your hand on my hand and let me hold your hand. And he said, when I put my hand on her hand, I felt it. I felt her love. You see, it's not literal touch. It's emotional touch. But that's what we're talking about here, is emotional touch. So there are ways to speak all these languages long distance. And I would say, uh, keep keep friendships alive by by speaking languages long distance. Yeah. Thank you. Would you say that dating relationships before marriage is helpful or harmful to a marriage? You know, people have different ideas on dating. My idea on dating is that the purpose of dating is to get to know the individual and to enrich each other's lives in the process. And as you get to know them, you're going to make a decision either to stop the relationship or to move to marriage. And I think that the dating process can be very, very helpful in making a wise decision about getting married. I do find some people who say they don't believe in dating. They just believe, you know, you let God lead and bring it at the right moment. They bring the person into their lives and so forth. And, and, I, and certainly God has done that. And I'm not going to tell God what to do. I mean, you know. But, 
but I, I don't, I don't, and, and dating is not a universal phenomena. As you well know, in many cultures, the parents arrange for the, for the marriage and they don't even know each other until they get married. But I do think that healthy dating, healthy dating can be very positive. And in the book that I share, shared last night, Things I Wish I'd Known Before We Got Married, I have a whole section at the end of that on how to have a healthy dating relationship and the kind of questions to ask to get to know each other. Yeah, so that, those are my thoughts, yeah. Thank you. Over here. Um, how would you suggest helping like a sibling or a parent or a friend heal if their love language has kind of been used against them? Like, how would you heal from that? Would you just be really intentional about using it positively, or yeah. what would you suggest? To use, any of the, to use any of the love languages in a negative way hurts that person far more deeply than you would hurt another person. For example, if words of affirmation is a child's love language, and you give that child harsh, loud words, you're hurting them far more than you'd hurt another child if that was not their language. So I think if you see this happening in any relationship, and, and you, are, you are involved in it, uh, and you see that child hurting over what's happened, I think you give them a chance to share their hurt. You say, honey, how, how did you feel when, when dad did that to you? And let the child share the hurt. And, and then hopefully, in a positive way, you share what the child has said with the person who hurt them and encourage them to apologize. Uh, you know, it all depends on how healthy or how mature they are because immature people are not open to change and they don't want to admit that they did wrong. Mature people or maturing people, I don't know that any of us are mature, but <laughs> maturing people are wanting to learn and wanting to become better. Uh, so that would be my suggestion. Thank you. As an illustration in chapel this morning, you had us all say out loud just the words, I was wrong, just to see if we could get it out of our mouths, so to speak. Yeah. And it was difficult even in a, in a non-real situation, do you have any advice for just overcoming that subconscious attitude of, I can't, of course I'm not wrong, of course I'm right? Yeah. I think the people that have most difficulty admitting that they're wrong are people who grew up in homes where they, their parents seldom ever told them what they did right. But every day, they told them what they were doing wrong. And something inside that child started recording the message to them, if I ever get to be big, I'll never be wrong again. Because they've heard so much of what's wrong with them that when they get to be adults, to admit that they were wrong is saying, I'm a bad person. My parents have been right all along. I'm really no good. Those are the people that have most difficulty admitting that they're wrong. Let me just throw this out. Uh, when I say wrong, I'm not necessarily always talking about morally wrong. But if I've done something that's hurt the relationship, even though it's not sinful, if it's hurt the relationship, I need to be willing to say, I was wrong, I should not have said that. You know, I, I think I gave an illustration somewhere today of my wife who spent two weeks, I had no idea about it, she spent two weeks searching for material to upholster a chair that I sit in every morning and put my shoes on. Well, she had it fixed one day and I came in and I noticed that, you know, it was different. And so I was sitting in the chair and she came in and said, how, how do you like the, the, new, the new chair, the new upholstery? And I said, well, it's okay, honey. I said, I really like the other better. <laughs> and she burst into tears. Well, it wasn't, what I said was not morally wrong. I was just being honest. You know, I just, I like the other one better. But I realized, and, and she told me, she said, I've been looking for this material for three weeks and gone all over town and da 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 But when I realized that what I had said had hurt her, then I need to be willing to admit I was wrong. It's not morally wrong, but I was wrong. What I did hurt our relationship. I regret it. I wish I hadn't said it. I should not have said it. I should have thought before I said it. I should have asked questions before I said it. What I did was wrong. So if we can take it out of the moral category, we're not always acknowledging it's a moral wrong, but it's, it's acknowledging that we're human. And the fact is, all of us do things that are wrong. Okay. And then I wonder if you would close our time.
time in prayer. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to. Okay. Um, generally, how do you deal with insecurities in marriage and uh, between the, in relationships and especially spouses? Not sure I understood that. How do you deal with insecurities? Insecurity in a marriage? Yeah, between spouses or even in relationships in general. Bickering spouses fighting in relationships? Yeah. Okay, okay, just want to make sure I understood your question. Yeah, well, let's face it, without God, all of us are insecure. Our only ultimate security comes in a relationship with God. But some people emotionally are more insecure in who they are than other people are, and a lot has to do with the way they grew up. When we recognize that, I, I would hope that what I've shared tonight would be helpful. Because if you learn to speak their love language, and you learn to apologize to them, and they recognize that it's okay, you know, I, I don't have to be perfect to, to have a good marriage here, hopefully that will be, that will be somewhat helpful in the process. I think the bickering and the fighting back and forth, and let's face it again, that is very, very common in relationships because most of us did not learn how to solve conflicts before we got married. In fact, I never thought that we would have any conflicts. When I was in love, I thought, man, we agree on everything. But the reality is all of us have conflicts in every human relationship. And the biggest thing in solving conflicts, you're never going to get anywhere arguing. Because if you win the argument, they lost the argument, and now you've got to live with a loser. And that's no, no fun. <laughs> so the biggest thing is learning how to listen to each other empathetically and treat their ideas and their feelings with respect. It's essentially treating the other person like a human. Humans think differently, and humans feel differently. So if you can respect their thoughts and respect their feelings, even if you don't agree with them, and say, honey, I hear what you're saying, and it makes a lot of sense. Because it'll make, it makes sense in their head, always in their head. And if you listen long enough, you can honestly say, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Now, obviously, we disagree on this. How can we solve the problem? And you spend your energy looking for a solution rather than spending your energy trying to win the argument. Uh, in a nutshell, I think that's what I'd say. Well, thank you for being here tonight. Let's pray together and ask God's help. Father, we thank you that you have placed us in your family, that we are brothers and sisters, that you are our Father. Thank you for your provision in all of our lives. You know our past, every one of us. You know the positive things. You know the painful things. I pray that as your children, you would give us wisdom on how to, be, how to take initiative in stimulating growth in all of our relationships. And especially, I pray, for those who may have painful relationships, fractured relationships, that you would bring to their hearts and to their minds steps that they may take that have the potential of enhancing the relationship. I ask this for your glory. I ask this for our good. In the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed. Thank you.